Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Wright, who's going to be giving the first Comet webinar. Tim um, is a professor of satellite geodesy here at Leeds. He's the co-director for the Institute of Geophysics and Tectonics, and he's also the director of Comet, which is the Center for Observation and Modeling of Earthquakes, Volcanoes, and Tectonics. You're probably familiar with some of his work. He's made major contributions in using satellite geodesy to understand deformation of the lithosphere, um, both with respect to earthquakes, interseismic deformation, volcanoes, and I could go on and on. Um, but I'll give the floor to Tim. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I guess one thing that happens when you suggest something like, wouldn't it be great if you had a Comet webinar series, then, uh, then what happens is John, Jonathan has learned from the, the Tim Wright School of Delegation. If, if someone has an idea, you make them do it. So I'm here giving the first of these Comet webinars. We hope this will be a monthly occurrence. and um, It's a way of bringing the UK Comet community um, together um, on a monthly basis, but it's also a way of, of sharing some of our science with the rest of the world. So I hope this is working and the technology is okay. So I'm going to be talking about um, geodesy and um, really this kind of new era we're, we're in now where we have um, data everywhere of, of increasingly high quality, inc increasing the uh, high spatial resolution and temporal resolution. And what can we learn about continental tectonics in particular, and in particular the rheology of continental lithosphere from those observations? So let's see if this works. No, why is that not working? It was working a second ago. There we go. So this talk really is put together from contributions from a number of people, some of whom are in the audience to get today, in particular Tom Ingleby. Um, and Akbal Hussein, who made contributions to the first half of the talk, and Hua Wang and Ganjen, um, who made contributions to the second half of the talk. Um, the, um, I'm also grateful for a number of other colleagues who contributed um, as well in various ways, either ideas or specific parts of the science. And of course, we have to thank uh, our funders, um, largely in the UK from the National Environment Research Council but also from, um, from the EU through the EPOS project and through the European Space Agency. Okay, so I think um, we've entered now what really is a, an era of geodetic um, big data. So this is a compilation um, from the um, global strain rate model work done by uh, the University of Nevada in Reno by Corny Kramer um, and colleagues. And in that compilation, there were something more than 17,000 um, GNSS sites for the whole planet. And you can see this fantastic velocity field here for the Alpine Himalayan tectonic belt. This is in a Eurasian reference frame. Um, at the same time, we're getting global satellite missions like Sentinel-1 that are processing data for the whole planet and giving us real measurements now uh, with an incredible high spatial spe resolution. Um, within Comet, we're processing data, and you can you can download into Ferrograms already. And within the next uh, six to twelve months, you should be able to download time series and average velocities, at least for the tectonic belts. Um, so we've got huge amounts of data. So what can we learn from from all these data? Really, I want to focus uh, our kind of learnings in two areas. The first area is thinking about time dependent deformation, um, and particularly then focusing in on big fault zones, primarily thinking about Spratzlet faults, but also other fault zones as well. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about the, the bigger picture, what happens when um, India collides with, uh, with Asia. So that first part. I'm going to start by thinking about post-seismic deformation. These are two uh, nice photographs I've taken from uh, um, Stefan Bayes' blog. One was uh, taken um, immediately after the Napa earthquake in August 2014 uh, by a team from UC Davis. And the second photograph was uh, Stefan's photo um, from a few months later. And you can see the same curb stone in both that's been uh, gradually offset. So there's a displacement of 17 centimetres in the first one. And by December, that had gone up to 37 centimetres. And we can see the same um, observation in the interferogram. This is just a 12-day interferogram. Um, from a paper by John Elliott, um, and you can see again this beautiful knife cut through the uh, interferogram showing the slow creep 
that's really localized on the shallow part of the fault. We did a lot of work anal analyzing this, particularly using GPS data that was acquired by uh, Mike Floyd at MIT and Gareth Funning at UC Riverside, as well as uh, colleagues at Berkeley and the USGS. And this was um, inverted into a, a model for that after slip. And there was somewhat complex behavior that we observed um, around the fault, shallow segments that creaked. There were certain parts of the fault where the, the slip pattern really moved around with time in, a, in complex ways that we still don't really understand. Um, but actually, I'm not really going to talk about this kind of shallow after slip very much in this talk. When you, um, when you look at the bigger picture of post seismic deformation um, and you look at where post seismic deformation needs to be in order to explain all the observations, um, then you can, then about three quarters of earthquakes where post seismic deformation has been observed, you need to have some process going on in the, in the mid to lower crust. And this is from a review we published a, a few years ago, so that, yeah, these data could be updated. But I think that, that it's, it remains true that you'll need something deep in order to explain those observations. Now, in those 23 earthquakes and 49 studies of 23 earthquakes, which was the data set available in 2013, about 60% of those papers suggested that viscoelastic deformation was the, the main process going on. About 22% suggested deep after slip was important. And then there was a combination of both of those processes um, suggested by some authors. Um, of course, the problem with, with that as a statistic is it doesn't really reflect the mechanisms that are really going on in the earth. What it reflects is the prejudices of, as, of the authors and the way they think the, the earth works. Um, not that we're prejudiced, obviously, but um, also reflects the kind of short time periods that many of these, these uh, observations were made over. Often we get funding after an earthquake, we can maybe make a few years of observations. Um, and at that point, we need to write the paper. Um, so what we wanted to do was look um, at a, a longer time period and really try and go back to the original data, look at all earthquakes together and see if we could uh, come up with a more clear pattern. And this is work that uh, was published this year in GRL, um, work done by uh, Tom Ingleby, um, a PhD, PhD student here at Leeds. Um, and this, these are, this is the raw data set. So what Tom did was he, um, for each earthquake, he looked at the observation of the maximum post-seismic velocity um, um, or for the earthquake, and he tracked how that changed as a function of time. So by the time he wrote this paper, there were 34 moderate to large earthquakes for which there were data available. Um, so um, what you can see um, immediately from this um, linear plot here is you see the velocities plotted as these gray dots and they're decaying. So that most of that post-seismic velocities have decayed by about 20 years uh, for most earthquakes, but there's still a little bit of post-seismic motion going on quite late, um, according to um, some of those observation points. Um, the temporal behavior is more diagnostic. However, if you take it away from this linear plot and put it in a, a log, log plot, um, last time I did this, someone, someone uh, put this uh, quote, reminded me of this quote, which is from Richter. Uh, so Richter said I, he was lucky because logarithmic plots are a device of the devil. Um, in this case, sometimes they are useful. They are a device of the devil, obviously, but sometimes they're, they're useful and they enable you to collapse um, data from different events onto a, onto a single axis. And you're not so much worried about a single order of magnitude and scatter, but it enables you to compare very small velocities down here on the rates of a millimeter per year or so uh, with these much higher velocities where we're talking a, you know, a, a thousand or uh, millimeters per year or so up here and allow, allow us to compare those. And what we were surprised about was the simplicity of this pattern. Uh, what you can see is that um, all of those data points are between these two lines, which both decay um, at one over t, that they're linear in, in power law um, space. Um, and uh, it's true for the overall pattern. It's also true for individual earthquakes. These black dots are for the park field um, earthquake. These are various GPS sites near near the fault. And you can see over a very large range of time scales here, we've got that one over t to k. What you can do then to take this a step further is say, actually, there's only really a single number you need to solve for um, for each earthquake, which is a kind of scale factor that is whether it's 
2 over t or 110 over t in the extreme cases. So for each earthquake where there are multiple time points, you can normalize it all um, to the average line. And then you get these blue dots here. So these are, these are normalized. And what you see is a remarkably uh, simple pattern where this is a fit using um, a, Mori's, uh, uh, a modified Amori's law that's essentially for most of this curve is one over t. Um, and those are the 95% confidence lines. And we can use this then to test those mechanisms um, for post-seismic deformation. What you can see immediately is that these observations are incompatible with uh, a model of where we have uniform um, linear Maxwell rheology. Um, so you can look at the early data, and here's a prediction from a linear Maxwell rheology. Um, you would expect for 10 to 17 pascal seconds, you can match the very early data, but you're under predicting the velocity later on. If you have a much higher viscosity, let's say 10 to the 21 pascal seconds in red here, what you find is you, you, don't, you under predict the early velocities, but you can match the very late velocities. Um, this is kind of another way of saying, um, of making the kind of well-known observation that the effective viscosity um, increases with time. Uh, a lot of people get around this, have got around this using a Berger's rheology. So Berger's rheology enables you to have two different viscosities for the material. Um, and what you see here is you, you effectively get a, a, a weak uh, viscosity for the early part, and then you get a, um, a strong rheology that relaxes slower and later, and you get these kind of two humps. So you can fit most of the data points, but, but really you're, you're not really satisfying this one over t rule. So it's kind of, it, it can work, uh, but it doesn't, um, it's not very satisfactory as a fit to the data, I would argue. Um, on the other hand, if you use rate and state frictional afterslip, in particular if you use the simple steady state formula, then you get a prediction that matches the observation and you, you predict this one over t temporal decay very nicely. Um, and just as a note, this is identical to the form of a, a Mori's law for aftershock decay. So you just uh, replace some of the terms there and essentially it's exactly the same form um, formulation. The other model that fits is a, um, it's a power law creep model where you have a narrow shear zone um, with, oops, what have you done? There we go. What about you, Jonathan? Okay. Jonathan is operating the uh, mouse pointer and trying to match my erratic movements of the, um, of, the uh, yes, of the green dot that the people in, in the audience can, uh, um, can move, but apparently it's also quite noisy when he moves it. But anyway, so this, these predictions here, these different coloured lines, are um, for different values of the power law um, exponent, um, and what you can see is for n equals 1, of course, you just get the Maxwell rheology, um, and if you take, uh, as n gets higher, you get closer and closer to that 1 over t formulation, um, so, which is identical to the, the afterslip formulation. But you need a very, very high n. So you need n um, significantly higher than, than, than kind of 5 to 10 in order to match the, the data. And that's higher than people think from, from experimental values. Okay, so afterslip appears to be the... The, the most likely model for explaining at least the fastest part of the post-seismic deformation that we see. Some more recent work that we've been doing with, with, uh, with Chu Chang suggests that actually perhaps when you're trying to explain the full spatial pattern, you need some combination of, of, of afterslip and viscoelastic, um, and particularly to explain the far field sites where the velocities might be smaller and longer lived. Second question that we've been thinking about, and, and this is, um, work we've been thinking about with, uh, with uh, Akbar Hussain, largely the work of his PhD. Um, Akbar's also in the audience today. Um, and really the question here has been, do strain rates vary as a function of, of time throughout the seismic cycle? And the challenge we've got there as geodesists is that we've got 10 years or so of, of good data. And so can we um, use 10 years of good data to be able to say something about an earthquake cycle that might be 200 years long? So the trick we use in this case is to take a long fault, uh, in this case the North Anatolian fault, that's failed at different times uh, during its history. So in the east, it's failed uh, in 1939, 
and most recently it's failed in the West in, in 1999 in a couple of earthquakes. And so by assuming that the system is similar along strike, that means that different locations in space um, have a different time to the most recent earthquake. So in 1939, um, if, if we're over here near Erzinjan, the last earthquake was in 1939. So I, I'm trying to do maths in my head now. <laughs> What's that 70 odd years ago uh, uh, to the data? And, and obviously we're, we're now about 20 years since the, uh, the Izmit earthquake, a bit, a bit less in, in the West. So we've got a range of different time observations. Um, and so to address that, we have GPS data, we also have a, a huge amount of INSAR processing that was done by Ekbal during his PhD. This is really a Herculean effort to do all that processing. Um, and what he did was use the MVSAT um, archive, processed um, those data to obtain average velocities from between 2003 and 2010. Um, each was processed using the STAMP software. Um, he developed some iterative unwrapping techniques that you can read about in a, in a very nice JGR paper. Um, and then um, and that gives, and you can also then compare neighboring tracks. And so we think these are good to about two to five millimeters per year, um, depending, on, depending on the track. And then we use the GNSS data from the global strain rate model to tie those all into a, a, a common Eurasian reference frame. And then we then use that in a, a 3D inversion to solve and separate out the east-west velocities from the vertical velocities. We assume the north-south velocities are known from the GNSS. The inside is not very sensitive to north-south, um, and also um, most of the tectonics here is east-west. So I think that's a reasonable assumption in this case. So here are the east-west velocities, for which you can see this change in colour very strikingly across the North Anatolian Fault. The vertical motions uh, are not very systematic. You see localised effects, um, um, a lot of which are due to hydrology, and most of them are within five millimetres a year of, of zero. So if we have a closer look at that, what we then wanted to do is look at the North Anatolian Fault itself. And, and the key measurement we wanted to get out of here was a measurement of the strain rate, so the gradient of the velocity at the fault and how that strain rate varied in space. Um, and so to do that, we took a series of profiles perpendicular to the fault, projected the uh, velocity field uh, from the INSAR um, and the GNSS onto that profile, um, and here's an example here from the West. And then we solved for the classic uh, Savage and Burford screw dislocation model to obtain the slip rate and the locking depth. And we also accounted for the rotation of Anatolia in that formulation. Now, we're not saying that this is the right model and that these data are the right, um, the right um, uh, that this model um, is correct. And you know, this model assumes everything's elastic and and motion is on a very narrow fault beneath the locked lid. Um, but it's a good way of estimating the gradient of noisy data at the fault, which was the intention. So actually, if you try and do it directly, it's very hard to measure that gradient. So this is a way of getting at that gradient. It also enabled us in places where there's shallow creep. This is an Izmit Pasha here. Um, and we also added an additional parameter to solve for the rate of shallow creep we could then strip that shallow creep out and just look at the effect from the deeper motion to get us the strain that's coming from that motion of the lower crust. Um, so it enabled us to, to really get at the variation in the strain rate that's coming from the deeper parts of the, of the system. And here are the profiles coming from the entire fault. So this is, um, yeah, there's, there's, what are the 20 profiles across the fault here. And you see what's instantly visible is how similar most of them are. You, you're seeing this um, arc tangent shaped profile um, in a very consistent manner across the fault, the exception being the few places where there's a little bit of creep down here and also here post seismically after the Izmit earthquake. You can then, from each of those profiles, extract um, the key parameters from the models. So you can get the slip rate here, which is then plotted as a function of distance along the fault. And what you can see is that the slip rates show this gradual increase from east to west, um, going about, they starting about 22 millimeters per year, going to about 26 millimeters per year in the west. Um, the, the locking depth um, from that formulation is fairly constant at around 16 kilometers uh, for the entire, uh, for, for every single profile. Um, you can then um, 
calculate the strain rate from the gradient of, of that line it, and you can do it analytically as the slip rate over pi times the locking depth. And what you get is a, again a pretty flat strain rate. So almost all of those strains um, are within this uh, 0.5 plus or minus 0.1 microstrain per year uh, strain rate. And there doesn't seem to be any relationship at all. This is the slips from the previous earthquakes. Um, there doesn't seem to be any relationship at all uh, between those slips um, and, uh, and the, the strain rate along the, fold, along the fold. So you can then take those data and you can plot them um, each point as a function of time since the last earthquake. These blue dots here are derived from INSAR and GNSS uh, from the velocity field um, in the way I just described. This red dot is a really critical dot. This was uh, derived from uh, pre-1999 GNSS observations from McCluskey um, and colleagues um, in the location of the Ismit earthquake. And at that time, the most recent earthquake was more than 200 years ago. Um, and then the other key bits of information are here. These are post-1999 um, GNSS observations showing the decay of the post-seismic velocity following those 1999 earthquakes. And those are from Ergentau um, and colleagues. Um, so the key result really is that the strain rate along the entire fault is pretty much independent of the time since the last earthquake, except in that decade uh, following a major earthquake. Um, so this is good news um, if we want to use geodesy to constrain seismic hazard models. Um, what we don't know, of course, is whether this is also true for smaller faults. This is a big, very uh, big structure. And so that's a question that, that's worth, worth considering. But at least for this big structure, it wouldn't have really mattered when we measured the geodesic strain rate, we'd have got the right um, geological slip rate out of that fault. So what are the implications of that for the rheology of the lower crust? We can take a very simple viscoelastic coupling model. This is with an elastic lid over a viscoelastic substrate. This is from Savage and Prescott, a very well-known um, model. You have repeating earthquakes in the upper layer. Then the surface deformation is controlled by um, a non-dimensional parameter, tau zero, that's basically the relationship between the Maxwell time um, and the inter-event time. So it's the ratio of those two numbers. Uh, if you have a low tau zero, that uh, if everything else is equal, that implies a low viscosity, and a high tau zero implies a high viscosity. So you can try and predict the strain rate as a function of time at the fault using that very simple model. Um, and here we're showing, first of all, a curve for uh, 10 to the 17 pascal seconds here. Um, and at the bottom, so that's the full part of the time series, and at the bottom we're just showing a a zoom of the first 20 years to emphasize the post seismic velocity. So if we have a viscosity of 10 to the 17 pascal seconds, we can match these very rapid initial post seismic velocities, um, but the, the, they decay uh, too slowly initially and too quickly uh, later on. So we under predict the velocities later in the cycle. Um, so we can't match the temporal evolution. Um, as we increase the viscosity, um, what happens, so now we're up to 10 to the 19 pascal seconds and 10 to the 20 and 10 to the 21. What you get is a more, a more flatter and flatter uh, distribution of strain throughout the cycle. So essentially the post-seismic decay, uh, post-seismic relaxation takes longer and longer and longer to decay to the point where it reaches a kind of steady state. So you don't even see an individual earthquake. Each earthquake only contributes a, a very small amount to the earthquake. Um, and you need that um, that's what you need basically to match these points later in the cycle. You, you need to have a high viscosity in the lower crust. Um, but of course, if you do that, you don't match the early post seismic. Um, so, the, and this is again with maximal relaxation. So, you can match um, you know, most of the cycle. So, you can match 95% of the cycle, but you can't match that post seismic with a high uh, viscosity. If you want to match everything, what you can do is combine what we learned from the work with uh, Tom Ingle, led by Tom Ingleby, um, and put a, a, a modified Amori's law type post seismic decay in to simulate after slip for that initial part of the post seismic period. Um, and then we have a, a relatively, and that's embedded within a material that has a, a background uh, substrate that has a relatively high viscosity. Um, the details of this model may not, may not be correct, and there may be 
other ways of doing this, but what essentially you need to explain these observations is something that will relax quickly to explain the post-seismic observations, and then something that doesn't relax uh, at all, essentially to, to match the, the later part of the cycle. Something that matches, relaxes very slowly here anyway. Okay, and this is true. We can also look at other earthquakes. There are a bunch of earthquakes uh, uh, there's at least four strike-slip earthquakes where there were rapid post-seismic deformation observed immediately after the earthquake and focused into seismic strain has been observed late in the cycle. Um, and you can plot all those on it, you can normalize all of those and plot them on the same graph and you end up with the same picture. Essentially, you need to have a rheology around these, these big fault zones that gives you rapid post-seismic deformation and focused into seismic deformation. This is a compilation uh, from a, a, a review paper uh, led by John Elliott that was out last year. Okay, so that's part A of the talk. And the summary really, um, so the strain rate along the entire North Anatolian Fault is independent of the time since the last earthquake, except in the decade following a major earthquake. Um, so these short-term observations are representative, at least for the big faults of the long-term seismic hazard. Uh, the apparent low viscosities that some people de uh, determine from post-seismic studies uh, prob probably don't reflect the viscosity of the lower continental crust, which needs to be higher for these, uh, um, so to get these strain concentrations late in the cycle. And you need after slip or the relaxation of a high end power law shear zone to explain most of the post-seismic strain history. Um, and then you get out these relatively high viscosities for the for the lower crust of 10 to the 20 pascal seconds. Um, and that's a lower bound, so it could be much, much higher than that. Um, okay, part B. Um, so the second part, I want to zoom out and think about continental scale deformation um, and focusing again on this India-Asia collision. So this is a, you know, one of the, the most well-known collision zones on the planet. It's the biggest deforming area on the planet. Here's India. Uh, moving north, um, colliding with the Asian continent, creating earthquakes over a, over a huge uh, distance range here. So this is kind of the classic uh, location for continental, tectonic, continental tectonics. Any model of continental tectonics needs to be able to explain um, what's going on in the India-Asia collision. Um, so how have people tried to model this? So um, I'm slightly hesitant about going back to these, these this kind of very long-lived kind of controversy, but, but actually I think it's a useful framework in order to be able to, to explain uh, how people have thought about the India-Asia collision. Um, so one way is to, uh, that people have used is to think about it as basically like plate tectonics. Um, you break up the zone into a number of crustal blocks, um, these are treated as microplates, so they can rotate and translate like plates, but they're only uh, allowed to deform in the strictest sense along their boundaries. And they must be kind of fully isolated like, like plates, so they have boundaries all around them. So the first of these was by Jean-Philippe Avalac um, in, the, uh, in the early 90s. So he had four blocks. There was no GPS data to constrain them, but he used um, some slip rates on faults to constrain those. Um, when the first GPS data came out, then um, Chen et al. Um, in, uh, in the early 2000s published a, a four block model as well, but allowed those blocks to deform, which uh, is cheating again, isn't it really, I think. But um, so there's four deforming blocks there. Um, Thatcher in 2007 had 11 blocks with 349 GPS data. Um, Lovelace Mead published a 24 block model um, that also included internal deformation to model uh, 731 GPS sites um, in, in 2011. And, and this year, there's a 30 block model that's just come out from Wang et al. Uh, in GJI that, that's um, constrained. Uh, in fact, they fit the 1850, 1854 GPS better than the noise um, of the GPS data, which is it's always good. Um, so, I mean, obviously, the observation here is that the more observations we're getting, the more blocks we're needing to, to match the data. So the smaller those crustal blocks need to be. Um, you could argue that was also useful because it's giving us information about more and more faults within that. So the alternative approach has been to use viscous continuum models. 
um, and this was pioneered by um, England and Houseman. Um, this is the first model of uh, the India-Asia collision, again, not constrained with, with GPS data, but they were really thinking about modeling the topography. So this was um, a simple thin viscous sheet. Uh, Neil and Houseman in 1997 adapted this and included a rigid terrene basin to try and explain um, the low topography there and also the, the strain and the mountains in the Tian Shan. Um, uh, Flesh et al. and JGR 2001 um, started to use GPS data and at that point there were about 350 GPS sites um, and they actually solved for the spatial variations. It was still a thin viscous sheet model but they allowed the strength parameter, so the effective viscosity, um, to vary in space. Uh, more recently, uh, Lechman and others um, in JGR um, used a few more, about 550 GPS data. They, they tried to build a 3D viscous model that had various strong blocks, but also weak faults within it. So it's sort of a similar pattern to the block model really here. As the data has got better, and actually in this case, as computers have got faster, there's more and more complexity gone, gone into these models to try and explain the observations. So what I wanted to do was try to take a step back at that and see what actually are the key features of the data um, that any of these models needs to be able to explain. Um, so here's one version of the strain field. This is from the global strain rate uh, model. Um, and you can see here a very nice velocity field. With, um, and I'll, I'll describe it in some later figures. Um, it's worth noting that the GPS observations are still relatively sparse. Here, so there are some large gaps in the data, and even where they look dense, often they often the spacing is, is larger than 50 kilometers. So they're, they're, it's a relatively sparse field. There are a couple of ways of, of improving that. One has been to, to try and use INSAR to fill in some of those gaps. Um, we've got a couple of examples here. One we published a few years ago looking at Western Tibet using, um, and one that's um, in prep at the moment looking at the South Central Tibet. But actually, the, the details of it here don't really change the story very much um, for Tibet. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is present a new velocity field that's come from working uh, with uh, um, colleagues um, at Wuhan and, and Guangdong University that incorporates the, the latest data from the Chinese network um, uh, and combines that with the data from Cornet Kramer from further afield. So here there's, uh, there's 2,576 a GPS sites now. It's a really incredible um, and beautiful velocity field um, um, here for this region. And so you can take this and you can calculate the strain rate. This is the second invariant of the strain rate tensor. Um, so it's really the magnitude of, of, of the strain. And what I want to do is kind of go through this and, and think of what, the, what I think are the key observations that any successful model needs to be able to, to match. I think the first is that there are relatively large non-deforming regions, undeforming regions. I could have included India, of course, in that, which is the biggest of them all. Um, the Indian plate has some internal deformation, but very little compared to the other side of the India-Asia collision. Um, but you've got the Tarim Basin, and the, um, the Sichuan Basin, the South China Block, the Wadas Block, etc., that really don't appear, appear to have a lower strain rate than some of the other, uh, other regions. At the same time, there is there are regions of relatively high strain that are focused around some of the major faults. You see it particularly well in the Himalayan frontal thrust and, and the Saigang fault here, and also around the uh, uh, Tian Shan and the Alton Targ and the Zhang Shui He fault. Apologies for my pronunciation um, to all my Chinese colleagues. Um, you see it also in profiles along individual faults. So here's a series of profiles along the Altin Targ and Haiwan fault here, um, going um, along the bottom here. Hopefully you can, you can link the individual profiles to, the, uh, to each other, to their locations. Um, what you see here is the strain concentrations are all relatively similar, but the magnitude of the, the velocity of the fault um, uh, varies as you, uh, so here it's around uh, uh, just about one millimeter per year. In the central part of the Alton Targ, it's around eight millimeters per year. And it, this is about five, and it decays down to about three or four by the time you're at the, whole, at the, whole, the high one fault. Um, and so these strain rates vary along strike. It's also worth noting that these strain concentrations 
to an end in a way that uh, you don't see it in, in block models. Um, there are also areas of diffuse strain, so we could take uh, the central uh, part of Tibet um, and, and up here out, in, out towards Mongolia, these large regions where the strain appears to be distributed. Um, there are some possible localizations here, but we don't have too much faith in those based on the noise and the data. There are essentially large regions of, of diffuse strain. You can see that again in, in some of the profiles. Here are the locations of profiles. These are um, blue one here is TP1, which goes across across there. Um, the red here is TP2. And if you take the interior part of the plateau, you could basically draw a straight line through that and, and you won't really see any individual strain concentrations until you get to the Himalayan frontal thrust or the Altintal here. Similarly, if you took this green line here, that's this one here, you've got a very smooth long wavelength distribution of, of velocities. There's no clear strain concentrations. Um, the next key observation is the dilatation of the, the high plateau. And, and this is also um, observed in a nice paper by um, G et al, published in 2015 with a, an earlier version of the Chinese velocity field. What's plotted here is the dilatation rate. So these bright yellow to white colors are areas that are dilating and therefore the crust um, is thinning. This black line is the 4,750 meter contour and appears to be a reasonable correspondence between these high areas of the Tibetan plateau and the areas that are dilating. And this is something that's been also observed um, in, in earthquakes. The rates of those, that dilatation, these are, taken, these are two regions that were defined in this paper by G et al for North Tibet, South Tibet, and we get very similar numbers to them around seven to nine nano strain in northern Tibet and five to seven in southern Tibet. There doesn't appear to be any significant difference between north and south Tibet uh, in the dilatation rate, which suggests that geometric spreading over the frontal thrust isn't the cause of that. Uh, I'm getting some smirks from uh, Tim Craig in the audience, who may disagree at the end. Um, okay, so uh, that's the fourth key observation. So. How do, the, how do the various models stack up then if we look at those, those observations? Well, both block models and continuum models can give you uh, large undeforming regions. For continuum models, you have to, so it's somewhat ad hoc, you have to impose, um, you have to impose strength contrasts, or there are some, in some cases, there are locations where there are undeforming regions because there are no forces on them. But to make the terrene basin, for example, you need to make it stronger. Um, Strain focused around some major faults. Um, so block models, of course, give you strain concentrations, but they are they completely isolate the, these crustal blocks, um, and they would have uh, rates at least for strike slip faults, where the faults um, that the rates of motion should be entirely predicted by the location of the plate boundary and the Euler pole, and that doesn't that doesn't work um, for the big faults in Tibet. Continuum models, of course, also don't give you these, these strain concentrations around, around faults. Um, again, without imposing weak zones or, or, or other features. Um, areas of diffuse strain, um, really block models can only do this if you make the blocks very small. And so what the diffuse strain becomes the elastic strain field from the interactions of the faults along the boundaries. Um, so, if the blocks are big, then you don't get areas of diffuse strain. So continuum models, of course, do this. This is what they're really good at. Um, and the dilatation of the high plateau, really, in, in block models, um, again, that's quite hard to do. You could do it with lots of making your blocks very, very small. Um, there'd be no real, there's no, di there's no dynamics, no, no real physics in these block models. You can fit all the data, but um, they're not really telling you why that's happening. Continuum models can do it. You need, of course, a change um, in, in the force condition in order, in order to do it. It wouldn't necessarily do it in steady state. Um, so here we are. Block models, I think, don't work um, and they're not very useful. I think it's time. They're very popular in the geodetic community um, because, you know, we can, we can build these models. We can explain the data very nicely. Um, but the fact that every time we get new data, we have to add new blocks tells me that it's not a useful, it's not a useful model. Um, so continuum models 
don't work yet either, really. Um, they certainly don't explain all of those key features yet. Um, the particular one around strain concentrations is work um, where various people are thinking about. There clearly needs to be mechanisms for imposing strain localization um, that could come from weakening effects as you, as you accumulate strain around faults. Um, perhaps it could also come from earthquake cycle effects. Remember, we're seeing that short-term velocity field that's a combination of that regional velocity plus post-seismic, et cetera, from repeated earthquakes. So it could be that earthquake cycle effects are needed. But um, I'd argue that they can uh, be useful. You can make predictions from them. You, you can test rheological models, for example. Here's an example from Alex Copley's work um, in Eastern Tibet, where you get a very different prediction to pet for, the, for the vertical velocity field, depending on whether you have a weak lower crust in red there or a strong lower crust. The horizontal are predicted to be very similar. So you can make, uh, you can test hypotheses, you can test rheological models um, using, using these time, types of continuum approaches. And I think for thinking about earthquakes, it's better to assume that we don't know where the faults are. We've been we're continually surprised by earthquakes that happen on faults that we either didn't know about or where we'd underestimated the, the hazard. Um, so my view would be to take a sort of continuum approach to thinking about the, the earthquakes and look at the strain measurements um, themselves. There are ways, this is, this is work by Bird and Creamer, who made a prediction based on an earlier version of the global strain rate model um, of the rates of earthquakes. So they think in very strange units. So earthquakes, so these, they think in uh, log 10 epicentroids per meter square per second, which is a hard unit to think about for me anyway. So I translated that for you. So green is one earthquake per century in a 100 by 100 kilometer region. And then it's a log scale, so you can go a factor of 10 if you, if you go to the yellow color. Um, so they compared it to the re real earthquakes um, and you get a, a reasonable match and their latest model you, you can get something that um, has a comparable accuracy um, to um, using historical earthquakes if you're using the geodesy. Um, this is taking our uh, strain rate tensor and we haven't, I'm not plotting here a prediction for the number of earthquakes um, but I'm just plotting the histogram of the second invariant of the of the strain rate tensor. Um, and you can see that um, around, uh, around uh, more than half the region is straining at rates greater than 10 nanostrains per year. So this is, uh, our error bar in here is probably around four or five na uh, nanostrains per year. We wouldn't be confident in saying anything was straining uh, much uh, uh, beyond that um, for the, in this region. So. Um, 10 nanostrains per year, you can do a simple cost drop calculation. You need at least 10 to the 19 newton meters of earthquakes within um, 100 by 100 kilometer block in a layer that's 15 kilometers thick um, per 100 years. That's the kind of rate of earthquakes you'd be generating. So that's, for example, one magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake. You could, of course, have more smaller earthquakes, or you could wait longer and have a bigger earthquake. Even for those regions of lower strain, so about 35% of the region has this lower strain rate, which we're reasonably confident in saying it's less than five nanostrains per year. Um, you know, actually, the difference between five and 10 isn't very much. You could just dump, you still get 10 to the 19 newton meters in 200 years. So, actually, nowhere really here is, is yeah. we can't rule out areas as being completely um, risk free in terms of earthquakes um, in this region. What we can do, say something about is the relative likelihood in, in different regions. Okay, summary of results from part B. Um, so the present day strain rates um, show these un, uh, large undeforming regions, strain localization, regions of diffuse deformation and the dilatation of the high plateau. Um, block models uh, don't work and are not useful. Continuum models don't work that well, but can be useful in helping us test rheological models. Um, we need, I think, to develop models that incorporate strain localization um, and or include earthquake cycle effects. Um, and that's, I think, where the, where the modeling needs to go. Um, high resolution measurements of strain will, I think, be increasingly important for improving earthquake um, hazard models. 
I just thought I'd end with a kind of final thought. Um, so, you know, if you take a fault zone, what you might, you know, what the mayor might want to know. Actually, the first thing they normally want to know is when is the earthquake going to happen? And we, we can't tell them that. But more questions we can answer. Um, you know, how likely is an earthquake to damage my city? What type of earthquake might, might happen here? Um, and to, to answer that, we need to know a bunch of things, right? We need to know the slip rate, the size of dates of previous earthquakes, you know, locked, whether it's locked or creeping. We need to know that not just at the surface, but for the entire fault plane. Uh, we might want to know the temperature, the viscosity, the composition of the rocks, the fluids that are there. And we can use geological observations and geophysics at the surface. Uh, we can use imaging techniques. Um, we can listen to the earthquakes. Um, and we have to combine those in models. And actually, if we really want to influence decision makers, we need to work with social scientists and think about engineering you know, um, as well. So my final take home message is that we need to work together to solve big problems in earth sciences. That's a big happy ending. There. Okay, so I'll leave it there and maybe take some questions. Thank you. People still watching. Or are they just They've increased? The advantage of being online is they can also do their email at the same time. So, okay, turn the volume down. Right. Are there questions in the room or online? Do, oh, so I have to open. Okay. Can you do it? Yeah, please? sure. Please click on that. Yeah, sorry. Chat. Yes, still watching. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emily. I'm really impressed that it's made it all the way to Menlo Park. Um, any questions? I, I, maybe I, not a question or comment. Um, the, I think your argument that it's actually better not to know where the faults are, but more important to know where it's straining instead, yeah. is actually quite relevant to the engineers and the probabilistic hazards modelers as well, because they don't actually know where the faults are either, and it's yeah. not actually required to do probabilistic and hazard assessments. Yeah. And in fact, I think that's a much better way of doing it than if you know where the faults are. Often. Great. Yeah, so I, th no, I think that's right. I think we could know, we could, um, yeah, you can put in these regional sources kind of in, exactly. in, the, in, the, in those hazard models, and I think that's probably the way to go. Right, so we have a question from Chris Jackson. Um, what additional data types would be useful, or is it simply a case of more measurements from existing data types? That's a hard question. <laughs> um, what do you think, Chris? No, I think it would be, it would be what we really I'd like is more direct or, or more observations of what's going on in the lower crust. I think that's that's the key location that's linking um, what we see in terms of the deformation to what's happening in the um, in the earthquakes. Um, so, um, so for example, imaging, you know, seismic imaging of the kind of work that you do, Chris, of big fault zones. What? Do, how do faults? What happens to big strike slip faults? Um, Beneath them, uh, beneath the uh, yes, indeed, deep seismic profiling would be useful. Um, yeah, <laughs> and, um, this is very strange having this uh, interactive way, uh, but also kind of geological observations, more information from from boreholes, more samples from deep parts of, of fault zones, more lab laboratory experiments. I haven't really talked about at all. Um, more models, more data. And I'm very data driven, but I think those that in the end one collects data to be able to test hypotheses. Um, and so we need, we need the modelers to kind of look at this latest generation of, of observations and kind of work out how to, how to explain it. Okay, well, right, so next. Someone asked if, if Ekbal could uh, repeat oh, what he had said. So Ekbal's comment really was that, um, that the earthquake engineers find it useful for, um, for um, to have these distributed sources as well, actually. So you can either put in faults where you know them, or you can put in distributed sources, and, and actually that could be a, a useful approach. Right. Okay. Yes. So Sam cleverly noticed the strip of negative dilatation across the centre of Tibet, um, and he's pretty sure he sees normal faulting earthquakes right across the region. Is he sure the geodetic data are accurately recovering the dilatation field? across there, um, have you considered comparing the strain rates from GPS with earthquake rates? Okay, so um, are we sure that it's right? No, I think those shorter wavelength features 
could be wrong and it's something I think that's worthy of further investigation. So I think the broader picture I think is okay. Um, the other thing that you, so it could be just noise in the data, um, but I think it could also be post seismic um, from the Coppocsilli earthquake um, and that can influence things as well. So that those GPS data have been corrected, but using a model that's probably not, not, you know, it's not going to explain the data perfectly. We don't have a model for any earthquake really that explains the post seismic data perfectly. Um, I think the the strain rates um, for earthquakes, you um, the comparison I think ends. Up, this is something that John did in his in a, in a paper, and I think you end up with, with about the right numbers comparing the the extension rate from GPS with the rates of normal faulting earthquakes. When you look at on, on a whole, I think I don't think we've got the resolution in the data to look in more detail. Okay, wow, Richard Katz. Regarding part one of the talk, the offset model provides good fit to the data, but what does it represent physically? What does the fit tell us about the controlling process or processes? So, I mean, what it's telling you um, is that, well, you can fit it with a, it's a rate and state friction model. And of course, rate and state friction in itself is a empirical model. Um, so it's based on fitting um, other empirical data. But what it's really telling you is that, um, so that model works, doesn't mean it's right, but let's say, let's say that rate and state friction is correct. Um, and so what that's telling you is that actually the, the friction depends on the, the rate and also something to do with how long you're, you're holding your, your fault together. So there's a, there's a relationship between the friction parameter um, and the rate that you're slipping at. Now, I'm, it's getting complicated on my screen here. Okay. Do you have an idea how strain rates can be incorporated in seismic hazard models? Um, yes, and well, I think that it, it's easy to do it the other way around. So it's easy to take earthquakes and calculate the strain rate from them. So this was a formulation from uh, Kostroff in 1974, um, where you can, so you basically can convert an earthquake into, using its moment tensor into the strain you'd expect in a volume from it. Um, going the other way is more complicated because you've got multiple types of earthquake that can give you the same strain rate. So you have to make an assumption, uh, first of all, about the types of earthquake you might have in a given region. And secondly, about how much aseismic deformation might be um, going on. Um, now for the continent, so Bird and Creamer have, have a couple of papers on this. And so I suggest you read the details in there. They propose one method um, that involves basically characterizing the types of earthquakes in individual regions and then kind of tuning them based on whether it's continents or subduction zones. But I think there's more work and more thought needed there. Okay. Please move right one. What's the next question then? Let's see. Okay, I've done those two. Any more questions? I think we... Any more in the room? Thank you, Tim. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Do we know who the next, who's giving the next one, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> no, stay... Uh, uh, stay tuned to the Comet website. We'll announce it via the, the listservs and the Twitter verse. Okay. So we identify an ins institution. Oxford University is. Oxford is, is going to be hosting the next Comet. They don't. Webinar. They don't know this yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Oxford. And uh, and yes, Jonathan and Marco will be in touch. <laughs>